Look, I know what you're thinking. You're a special snowflake. You love your own food. You train their own way. You have to wear your own gear. And you have to move your body in a certain way that's unique to you. And yet, there's always the same mistakes that seem to crop up with runners all the time. We always see the same types of injuries. So yeah. I've recruited my man Trevor from Perform for Life Run Lab to break that down for us. Trevor, yeah. you've put hundreds if not thousands of runners through gait analysis and strength uh, assessments. What are some of the things that you see? Yeah, so today we're gonna go through the top three things that we see in all the gait analysis that we've done and also give you corrective exercises to help you fix those main three things mm. that we see. So you can be your special snowflake, but you can also be a healthy one too. All right, Trevor, so what is the first mistake that you see? We are here in your studio and uh, you bring in runners all the time, all over the world. In fact, Coach Morgan trains here yeah. and uh, you're working with them both in their running and their gait analysis and their strength. So yeah, what is that first thing that you see? The number one thing that I've seen throughout hundreds of gait analysis is a valgus collapse of the knee. Ooh. So a valgus collapse is when the knee crashes towards the midline of the body. I see. So that means every time that a runner lands their foot down onto the ground, their knee will crash in directly towards the midline. And what that is caused by is a weak glute med. It's a muscle on the top of your mm -hmm. cheek right here. Um, and that weak glute med allows for external rotation. So the, this right. muscle pulls the leg out so this my way. Glutes, and especially what I like to refer to uh, affectionately as the side butt. Yes, the side butt, for sure. The side butt, the side butt. I well. like that. Uh, my knee is crashing in. Most definitely, yeah. And then with that crash, what happens is the muscles on the inside, the adductors, get overly active and really, really tight. Because they're trying to control and take up Exactly, the so the knee doesn't want to hurt itself. So they're trying to get tense, so mm. the knee doesn't keep crashing and get hurt. Right. Your medial meniscus, all the things in the inside of your knee on the inside. So to compensate for that, that gets us into our correctives and how to fix it. We right. need to strengthen the glute med yeah. and release the adductor, the muscle Ooh, on the so inside. Before we get into that quick fix, yeah. you know, if I'm a runner, how might I know if I am making this mistake? Um, a lot of times that we see when the knee crashes, you'll bring your leg out and around. If you ever so feel that your leg knees- like swings around this way. Exactly, or that if you ever feel your knees knocking, when you run, that's a knocking really or common. Brushing each other. Brushing each side. other, yeah. Not at the foot, but at the knees knocking, or if you see people running. And I like that you're bringing up those types of cues because you're not talking about pain. Like if no. your knee's already this like throbbing fireball, it's like hard to make a lot of changes at that point right. without really letting it calm no, down. Definitely, so yeah. you're really cueing in, and there's like some visual things uh, and some potential things that you could feel before. Right. Yeah, what we, notice in, right <laughs> what we notice in our lab is most people that come in with runner's knee or pain on the inside of the knee right here always have a glute med issue. imbalance or issue, activation strategy issue and things like that. So that's one of the first things that we work on to help reduce the pain associated with runner's knee. I love it. Well, let's get into that fix. All right, so we are down on the ground. I got a yeah. roller. What am I doing? Yeah, so basically, from what we learned before with the valgus knee, we have an overactive adductor group, the muscles on the inside, and an underactive glute med. So the first thing that we want to do is inhibit the activation of the adductors. So we're going to foam roll the adductors, the muscle of your groin, on the inside. So if you want so to go ahead and get that calm down and turned off a little bit? Yeah, exactly. Kind of down regulate the activation of that. They're always on. They're always trying to protect the knee. Mm. First thing that we're going to do is release them. That's true for me. So you're saying, <laughs> so you're going, I'm going to get on this thing. You're going to lay on this. A diagonal. Up. Exactly. Yep. From there. And then you're going to go ahead and just roll that up and down the whole distance of the adductor, the group on the inside. Now, this is different from regular foam rolling of your quad, right? Like my legs kick out to the side, I'm really getting that yeah. inside area. So you're getting a hole inside, that's the adductor group, yep. Oh, yeah. That's what pulls the leg in. Yeah, that's pretty exactly. tight. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a little tight for me. <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah. So we wanna go ahead and release that. We'll do that for about 10 to 15 seconds or so until you feel okay. like that's released, yeah. So then I've got that done. I've right. worked on both sides. Hopefully, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. So we've done that on both sides. And then from there, the next step is to activate the underactive muscle okay. group as well. So we'll cruise into that. So go ahead and lay on your side for me. Yeah. 
and then it's going to be the same side that I just The same thigh that you just said. So, so you'll lay on your right side, yep. Here. Exactly. Then I'm going to have you bring your left knee up to 90 degrees. Okay. Here, and you can kind of relax your head, get nice and comfy. <laughs> extend this There's leg. No really good looking natural way of doing this. Exactly. You're going to extend this leg, and you're going to internally rotate the leg. Now that is the most important part, by far most important. If you externally rotate, go and lift your leg up. Yeah. Let me know where you feel that. More That's hip flexor. TFL hip flexor. So internal yeah. rotation. Yep, is the glute med. And then what you do is drop that all the way down to the ground and lift that up as high as you can. Let's go and do 10 reps there. Oh, yeah. So we've inhibited the adductor group and now we're ad, uh, activating the abductor now, this group. This is a really interesting combo because, like, maybe like some other runners, uh, you know, I work on a lot of mobility and foam rolling at the end of the night. Yeah. But then usually I'm just going back to the couch. Gotcha. I'm not necessarily doing any type of this exercise. So to Most really definitely. make that work really anchor and set in, it's really to pair it with something like this, and that's where you inhibit and then activate. Exactly, that's inhibit, right. activate, that's the model, yep, exactly. Yep. And then from this, this would also be a great warm up too, because you know that this is a corrective exercise based on something that most people have an issue with. This is a great thing to add to your warm up. Perfect, well, uh -huh. let's go to <laughs> mistake number two. Yeah, awesome. So we've tackled the valgus knee. What is yeah. the second biggest thing that you see with runners? So the second biggest thing that I see is a lordotic curve in the low back. Ooh, it basically lordotic. means that the <laughs> lordotic. So the hips are shifted backwards, essentially. Mm. There's a curve in the low back that goes out, um, if that makes sense. It does. Sense. And, yeah. and the, the spine is curved, right? And there's a right. natural curve in the lumbar spine. But what you're saying is it's like too pronounced. And it's like way too pronounced. Mm. Yeah, it's overactive. And what that does is, and what it's caused by is usually tight hip flexors or a weak core. So the mm. core would pull that up. If the core is weak, then you can shift out as well as we sit a lot throughout mm. the day, right? Everybody sits a lot, whether it's commuting to work, anything like that. The hip flexors are overactive as well as in runners specifically, all you're doing all the time is driving up. Right, is yes. this. And how does this connect with extension? Because you were just of course. talking about that. Yeah, so uh, when the hip flexors are tight and you have a lordotic curve, you actually can't get into full hip extension, if that mm. makes sense. If you have a lordotic curve shifting back and you go to press off the back leg, you notice that you don't have the bubble butt, the glute activation at the right. end. If you fix the lordotic curve, all of a sudden you can get full extension. Yeah. And this is really interesting because you could do a lot of glute strengthening exercises, but if this position is off, it almost like doesn't matter. you're not going to use the glute. Yeah, yeah. Use it. yeah, we call it the glute amnesiac. Ooh. The glute amnesiac. Somebody that does not use the glute when they run. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. So, yeah, one of the biggest things there is just to ensure that the, you're fully driving through the glute, which allows you also to get triple extension. If you've heard of triple extension, that's when you're flexing the foot, knee, and hips all into extension. Now, how might I know if I am making this mistake as a runner? Uh, yeah, when you're so, like where you're sore, so you usually okay. feel it mostly in the hamstring mm. when you're running. Usually you're not using the glutes. The hamstrings are just a synergist. They're hanging on for dear life. They're hanging on for good luck. Yeah, yeah, they're a helper. They need their buddies. <laughs> they do. Yeah, yeah, so the hamstring is a helper. Usually if you're sore from high speed workouts and things like that, it should be in the glute. So, a lot more. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. So if you're feeling that pain in a hamstring or someone who's stretching their hamstrings out all the time and yet they're always tight, you're on the hamster wheel of terribleness, exactly. that might be an issue. Cool. Yes. And uh, I imagine you got some fixes for me. Of course, I got some fixes for you. Yeah. All right, let's get into that awesome. on the ground. <laughs> so you're saying that it's kind of difficult to really mobilize the hip flexor specifically without getting a kettlebell handle and a yeah, very close definitely. personal space. So one of your favorite go-tos is some sort of lengthening Yeah, exercise. so we're going to stretch the hip flexor. Ah. Here. Yeah, so if you want to go and hop into a kneeling position. So I've got my little pad here. Perfect. Knee here. And then I'm going to awesome. put this in this position. Make sure this front knee is at 90 degrees. So you're going to bring that knee just forward just a little bit right okay. there. Awesome. Make sure this foot is up and straight. From here, what I'm going to have you do is activate your left glute. So you're going to actually squeeze your left glute. What do you feel as you squeeze the left glute? Yeah, as I squeeze, I already start to feel a little exactly. bit of a stretch here. Perfect. So I'm going to have you squeeze the left glute for three seconds and then relax and keep the hips just where they are. Yeah. Relax the glute and then you will reactivate the glute. Okay. You notice squeeze each. Again. Yep, squeeze again about three seconds. One, two, three. And then relax. Four. Yep. Perfect. And you'll notice as we keep growing, you'll or keep going, you'll slightly stretch farther yeah. and farther and farther. Interesting. So this rather than just hold or push forward, it's interesting you're not telling me to just move my hips forward. Right. But you're really telling me to squeeze. So we want to associate the glute activation 
with that new range of motion. We don't want them to be isolated. Mm. If you just keep stretching and the glute's not engaged, it's gonna be hard to use that in running, right? right. So we want to associate the contraction. So you're really trying to make with this the stretch. carry over and translate. Yeah, everything needs to carry over unless there's no point, right? Awesome, how many rounds yeah. of this would I do? I will do 10 reps, oh, okay. 10 reps. So 30 seconds of stretching, three second yeah. contraction, and I think relax. I'm on number six right now. Perfect, almost there. Three. Couple more. Oh yeah, it's totally opening up. It should really open this up, This is so yeah. cool, so rather than me just force this, I'm really just focusing on here, Definitely. and it's just starting to open up more and more. Yeah. And we'll do a test at the end to see what the difference I is. I feel like my um, glute engagement is stronger. It should get stronger each time, right. yep, by the end. Yeah. yeah. And once you finish your like 10... almost like this works. Right? <laughs> Perfect. We'll slip the pad out, and I'll have you on your back once you finish with your cool. 10 there. So yep. I got my 10. Yep, so then go and lay on your back. So that is your stomach. Yes, lay on your back. <laughs> Perfect. So we're going to lay this way. So we're going to do a single leg glute bridge. Okay. A cool. single leg glute bridge. So I'll get on this side of you. Perfect. So we're going to do a single leg glute bridge on that leg that we already did. So you'll have our left leg down, um, right leg is extended straight in front of you. And you're going to just drive your hips all the way up as high as you can. Keep this leg down right there. Perfect. And we'll go back down and we'll do 10 reps there. Once you really drive through the top and squeeze the glute as tight as you can. We'll go and do 10 reps. Good. And what you'll notice is that you're really driving through. You should have full glute engagement at the very top. Yeah. What sure. percentage of that do you feel in your hamstring? Do you feel it mostly in the glute? I think I feel more glute. Okay. Is that like an 80-20 relationship or? I would probably say something similar. Something similar? 30 to 80 -20. Okay, great. A little bit of hamstring, but it's definitely a lot of... Yeah, so the hamstring is a center. It's meant to help with hip extension. Now the real test will be here. Now that you finish your 10, go ahead and take your right leg now and put yeah. that down. And we're gonna do a single leg glute bridge on the right leg without okay. stretching it. So we have not stretched your right leg yet. We wanna compare. We're gonna compare. So go ahead and do 10 reps here on the right leg. Let me know, do you feel that mostly in the glute or the hamstring? I'm assuming that will be more hamstring dominant right. Interesting. because you haven't fully released the hip flexor, hip flexor so you're yeah. not moving through a full range of motion with totally. that yeah. so you feel that more in the yeah, hamstring it's funky. yeah, yeah totally. right so as you can see if you were to go for a run without releasing you're going to get a lot more extension from the hamstring which is yeah. kind of like uh you know not doing it shouldn't be doing all the work it should be coming from the glute right. itself so really developing that connection first and then it's going to be able to show up a lot more naturally. Exactly. And then each stride will be more forceful because you're using the biggest muscle in your body. Then you'll run faster. I love that. That's that. This is so great. I can't wait to hear what you got and, uh, behind door number three. Perfect. Here we go. <laughs> so what do we got for our final mistake? Yeah, our third and last. So we're going to talk about cadence. Mm. Um, usually when athletes have a low cadence, we see a resulting heel strike. So we've all heard of the heel strike, right? What do you know about the heel strike? The heel strike is the idea where the first thing that you're, the first contact point on the ground is your heel. Stephen. Your foot is in front of your center of mass and you have to get up and over it. There's exactly. extra impact yeah. and potentially extra collapse and just a lot of extra, extra bad pain. stuff. Yeah, yeah, extra pain. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So when the heel is striking in front of you, mm. the impact forces are being directly sent into the knee and into the hip. It's almost like jamming. You're jamming the brakes every single time that you hit. So uh, we know that running speed, as we yeah. talked about, is how many steps you're taking a minute or your, right, which cadence, is your cadence, multiplied by how big of a step you're taking, right? right? Which is your stride length, which connects sure. to what we just talked about in the hip extension in the last piece. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So with those two together, we know if you want to run faster, mm -hmm. we need to increase cadence or length. Right. The reason a high cadence is so important is because it's more efficient. Right. It's much more efficient than increasing stride length. I can only increase my stride length so much without feeling like I'm bounding down the road right. and with bounding. these big, powerful steps. If you've done the bounding exercises, they're fatiguing. They're yeah, they're, they're tiring. They're, they're very they're expensive. Costly. Yeah, exactly. So with that, you're activating our type 2X fibers, our high force, high strength, high power fibers. Mm -hmm. And they fatigue really quickly. Right, which is, might be something I want for like a little finish line sprint or to power up a hill. Right. I was a football player back yeah. in the day. At some point, <laughs> right. I might need to do that. Right. But if I'm running longer distances, I want to save that for the race photos in the finish line, exactly. but have that more efficient gear. Right, so we know that type 
uh, one fibers are really associated with high cadence, totally. so less force to get you going. So how might I know if I have low cadence? What, what will be some good things to uh, look for? Yeah, so the biggest thing is either recording how many steps per minute that you're taking, mm -hmm. um, whether that's one foot or two. If you're measuring one foot, around 90 is considered optimal. Mm -hmm. Around uh, For two feet, around 180 is considered right. optimal. You're counting two feet in 60 seconds so versus, each step. versus Yeah, versus a that. really easy way to do that would be have your friend uh, record you running or start a stopwatch for 10 seconds, how many steps you take with your right foot, yep. and then multiply it mm. by six. And then you'll get that point. We know that for uh, taller runners like yourself, you want to be more in the 170 range. Interesting. And shorter runners are actually more optimal around 190. Well, that's good. So as the, well. the, there is no necessarily one magic number. It's no, going to vary no, based on the body of type. Of course. But we do know on average, 180 is a great goal to hit. Very, very cool. Yeah. So cool. once you measure that, then to increase cadence, you can use things like a metronome. And also there's apps. And you said uh, you were working on something like are, that. We got a little something that we're working on over here. <laughs> sweet, but sweet. you do a lot of um, you know, run gate analysis here at Run Perform for Life. Right. Uh, so you are going to actually get me on your treadmill and we're going to work on a little cadence fix, right? Perfect, yep. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm back on this treadmill. <laughs> Every time I'm on this treadmill, guys, in here, I end up suffering a little bit. But uh, hopefully go. I'm not going to be suffering right now. So right. what is this third fix you got for me? Yeah, so the third fix is going to be a metronome. This essentially beeps at a certain mm. uh, beeps per minute BPM. And we're going to set this around 180 for you okay. just to see. So really yeah. thinking about that beep per foot. Per foot, okay. yeah, exactly. So each time that the foot hits the ground, we're going to want to have that in sequence with the beep. Okay. And in theory, that should help reduce heel striking and improve your efficiency mm. as well. Sound good? That sounds great. Sounds good. So yeah. we're turn this thing on. Yep, I'm gonna hit start. We'll Starting get the speed, speed up. up. Right. To about seven or eight miles an hour comfortable. This thing pace. asks for my weight. I see <laughs> a lot of peach cobbler. We don't need to worry about that. <laughs> to get this thing going here. Get about eight miles an hour. Alright, now we're gonna set the metronome. Great, immediately caught on there, good. Yeah, it took a moment. Took a moment, but what you can see is, you know, even though you're at a slower speed, you're very um, mid-foot striking, you're definitely striking on the right. ball of the foot, and it should feel kind of effortless. It should feel like each step you don't have to propel and jump forward right, versus, as you move forward. Exactly, so slow. that would be a slow cadence. Exactly. That, with that slow one, foot's going forward, and I'm even bouncing up and down a little bit more. Yeah. But when the cadence is higher. Exactly, exactly. Yep, and we can decrease the cadence as well, if you'd like. Here's 160. This is what I see most runners are at. Now immediately you can feel that fatigue setting in, right. the movement is a lot deeper, your forefoot is not hitting the ground, it's now a heel strike. It'd be much less efficient and you're not gonna make it as long. Right. Great. Yeah. All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> so, how long, if I've never run at a 180 cadence before, right. and I am that 160 runner, how long should I try running at that? Right, so that's a great question. We want to work really gradually. So you actually only want to increase cadence around one beat per minute a week. Okay. So as you're going through your run, if you are going to use a metronome and you are at 160, that next week, try 161, the following week, 162, until eventually you'll be at that ultimum goal of 180. That's interesting. Now, if I'm on a treadmill and the speed is fixed right. and you change the rhythm, I'm having to adjust my stride length. Most but definitely. a big common thing with runners, when they start running with a higher cadence outside, is that they actually haven't shortened their stride length that much. So right. they feel burnt out because they're just running, running faster. Running faster, exactly. Yeah, that's a, a hard thing to battle. I would just try and stay at the same pace, same speed, but improve the cadence as right. well. And that one beat, you said per? Per week. Per week. Increase one beat per week. So if you're a 160 one, runner, that would be 20 weeks until you're optimal. 162. Exactly. And this nice, slow, gradual change, your body exactly. really absorbs that and everything. The most important thing there is it's meant to be a fix. It's corrective. If we just throw you to 180, we would assume that your body isn't really meant for that gait pattern just yet, and the yeah. muscles might be compensating, they might be doing something funky, and the last thing that we want to do is get you out of your training funk just totally. because we're trying to increase cadence. Totally.
So I love that nice slow progressions on the cadence and you could use a metronome or an app to do it. But I can't help but think that what connects all of these mistakes is something to do with your glutes necessarily Definitely. not firing either from the valgus yeah. knee to the big lordotic low back, even to the low cadence. So right. if you're someone who wants to drill down a little bit more into that glute engagement and get a few additional exercises to support that, we have made a glute engagement video for you and lucky for you, it is playing next. So awesome. Trevor and I are gonna stretch ourselves out. Woo -woo. Thanks again for being on here and we'll see you guys in that video. Biggest mistake.